All right, so here is that top layer that I was hoping to dry out and uh, it certainly has dried out. Looks good. In fact, I think, I think I can just pull this off and harvest it. So that, that's good. Um, we'll save this for the feeding later for the next layers down. But that's, that's nice. Everything's completely finished up except for maybe a pumpkin seed. But that is to be expected. Sometimes those take on the order of years. So let's pull that top layer off and see what the next layer is doing. I just made a huge mess dragging that across the floor that I just washed. <sighs> Such is life. All right, so then let's look in on this. You can see that this is a little bit compacted, but you can tell the worms have showed up. Look at that. We almost have a worm ball. So they loved what we fed them last time. And it looks like, that looks like it might be some electric compost, hard to say. But let me get in there and churn it up and see if I can find any leftover food. So they're gonna get some people scraps from the last couple of days. And then they are also going to get some more electric compost. But these look like some happy worms here. I'm trying to see if I can find any cocoons or anything, but I'm not seeing anything as of right now. If anybody sees any cocoons, shout it out, please. Uh, lemongrass. Cannot believe how well that grew in Illinois. Just absolutely amazing. I didn't baby it or anything. I had lemongrass and I actually had to let some of it go for the winter. Um, just didn't have any place to put it. I was hoping to overwinter it, but it rooted itself so deeply, I couldn't even get it to come out again. I chopped off as much as I could and I will definitely do that again. That was great having that this year. So in case you ever wondered, will, you know, lemongrass grow in cool environments? It will, you know, at least until the winter kills it. All right, well, this looks great. We'll feed this again today. And let's look at that next layer down. Okay, so here's the layer that has not had any people food at all. And it looks like they're doing a good job of, of breaking up that paper. It looks a little dry, so we'll get them some water before we leave today. I am seeing cocoons down here though. So here is a little red wiggler cocoon. I know that I was showing you the ginormous European nightcrawler cocoons from the worms I got from Mimi. Um, so these are just little guys. Uh, there is there is a correlation between the size of the worm and the size of the cocoon. Now, in the event that those European night crawls, crawlers reduce in size over the years, their cocoons will get smaller. All right, this layer is also just had people food and I'm seeing cocoons in here as well. Teeny tiny ones, that might even be a blue worm cocoon. If you Google what the cocoon looks like versus the type of worm, um, they say you can tell the difference between like a lemon shape and a teardrop shape and a round and all that. I am not that good. <laughs> I'm assuming these are red wiggler cocoons because this is a red wiggler only bin. But when I'm looking in blue, there's just all bets are off as to whose cocoon belongs to who. Whose baby is that anyway? So put some comments below if you have any questions about starting worm bins. This, I think personally, if I would have had this when I first started out, I would have had a lot more success simply because this doesn't lose moisture as fast as just an open bin. But if you don't have the money to uh, buy like 130 to 150, depending on if this is on sale or not, 
um, you know, a regular sweater tote is just fine for worms. Absolutely, I did fine for, I don't know, a couple years. Um, but I think this holds the water in better because of the stacking. Continuing down, you see our little friends, the pill bugs down here. And if you see these guys in your worm bin, these are helpers, these little isopods that are absolutely wonderful critters for shredding up paper and cardboard and leaves and anything that you have in your bin, um, as are any sort of springtails and mites. Um, so basically the worms could use some help breaking down their food, and those are the helpers that you absolutely want to see in your bin. Now, if you are in your spring gar garden and you have seedlings, um, you of course do not want to be seeing those little guys because then they are not your friend anymore. So who your friends are it depends on the circumstance that you're in. When you see mites on your plants, although they're not the same mites, not your friend. You see mites in the worm bin, different mites, they are your friend. Okay, that looks appropriate for what that bin is doing. Here is the very bottom. And again, more isopods. I'm seeing some springtails down here. And worms, even got a worm down here who seems to have been a little adventurous. Maybe he needed some alone time, I don't know. Moody teenager, took off to the basement, who knows. So then, um, although it does have some dry spots in here, I think it's pretty good, but we will add quite a bit of water to this system because at negative 17 degrees Fahrenheit current wind chill here, uh, the furnace is basically going non-stop. And uh, if it's not dried out, it definitely will be. Um, I don't know if you can see, let me change it a little bit. You can see just in the amount of time that I've had the worm bin open, the windows are fogging up from that moisture. So, um, yeah, definitely want to put some moisture back in just in case the furnace sucks it back out again. And then I do like to look at the bottom and see what's going on down here. And I did add a lot, a lot of water last time. So a lot of water did come down here and yet it's all gone. But we've got worms and isopods down here. I'm just gonna go ahead and throw this in that next level back up. Because when I do add that gallon or two of water, I don't want these guys to get drowned. Although it does have that worm ladder in the bottom here. Uh, I just, I'm not, just not a very trusting person. What can I say? So I'm going to clear that out. And sometimes I will put a little bit of paper in the bottom here, not only to soak up the, the water that goes down there, but also to give the worms in the bottom something to eat. If they happen to get stranded down there, I think that's for the best. Okay, now we're just gonna stack this back up and I know that originally I think this type of bin was meant for the worms to, you know, keep migrating um, up. But the truth of the matter is the worms actually go where they want to go. Uh, they do not follow the rules and the instructions whatsoever, no matter what bin I have had. And so I just make sure that each one of the layers is livable. That's been one of my teachable moments over the time that I've been running this system is to try and make sure that all, all of the layers have livable material. I used to just put dry cardboard at the bottom in hopes that it would just, you know, soak up any water from the food. But um, I also found dried out worms down there. So I have changed my method to, you know, suit my own particular house. You know, maybe if I live someplace where the humidity was high all the time, it wouldn't be a problem. But here, where I have air conditioning running half of the year and the furnace running the other half of the year, loss of moisture in my worm bins is one of my largest problems here. And the way that I mitigate it is to um, keep a better eye on it and then also have 
systems that will help me. So I'm also getting distracted by the um, springtails. And if you have springtails in your bin, they are tiny, tiny little, I'm trying to find them again, tiny little white things that are crawling around smaller than a gnat, like a quarter the size of a gnat, and they are also good. And one of the things I learned from some of my other worm family is that not all springtails spring. Mine, when I go across it like this, they're like popcorn. You can just see the wave of, of the little jumpy things. But in other people's bins, uh, they're more like uh, walktails instead of springtails. They don't jump around. All right, so here we are back at the top again, and this is nowhere near being done. So I think we're just gonna, we're just gonna keep feeding this. Since the other stuff on top of this was dry dry, I'm just gonna go ahead and take that out. It's almost seed starting time. And then we're gonna give these guys a good healthy feeding. Uh, before I disturbed them, you saw that there was quite a few worms. Okay, so now they're going to get a good feeding of eggshells and onions and pepper tops. And then I'm gonna sprinkle some of the electric compost. This should be pretty nutrient dense. It's had quite a bit of vegetable matter. I have uh, given up on some of my hydroponics and harvested all the basil. I was growing a miniature tomato plant, which turned out to be not so miniature, so I ended up having to kill that. It turned into a real tomato plant, unfortunately. So let me get them some water. So again with the cat litter theme, uh, buckets, and then sometimes I don't like to uh, carry a lot with me. Those things get pretty heavy going all the way up the stairs. So I just gave them right at about a gallon of water and that will drip down to the all the different layers down there and make sure that all the worms have nice uh, wet substrate for them. And I'll probably come in here later again today and see if the bottom is dripping and then also see if this electric compost, which I didn't pre-moisten, um, is gonna cause me a problem because this can turn like bread and turn moldy and stuff and hard, unfortunately. So if you have any questions about the red wigglers or the tower system here, go ahead and put that below. Okay, so that's about it. I wanted to thank everybody for hanging out with me and my worms and everybody have a good day.